Happily, I can confirm that Masters of the Air has lifted its game and improved on the lackluster efforts of the previous episode. We focus more on the people this time around, so if you're here for the big explosions and hot plane on plane action, this is not the episode for you. So hit that subscribe button so you can come back when there's more of that rat tat tat that you know and love. Like I said, a good episode this week. Not quite as high as it could be, but better than last week. There's some new crews, we get to see more of the crews that were bailing out of the planes in the last mission. If you were hoping that the trip to Africa would be worth anything, you should be prepared to be sorely disappointed. We get a lot more dialogue in this episode, more exploration of the characters and the thoughts. Maybe not as deep as I would have liked. I guess you have to expect that in the armed services because everyone's a man's man and any sign of weakness is frowned upon. Again, we have issues with the dialogue being too low in the mix, requiring subtitles. Also, you will need to watch this in a dark room or else you will not be able to see what is happening in the night scenes. Added to this is the fact that the volume is being used a lot to emulate the surroundings instead of shooting on location, which always seems off to my eyes. In summary, less mission footage, more talking and getting to know the crew. I'm giving part 4 a 7 out of 10. They just need to develop these characters to allow us to really empathise with them. Now, onto the spoiler section. Focusing less on the in-plane action and more on the interpersonal interactions of the crew as they celebrate the first pilots to successfully complete 25 missions, thereby earning a ticket home. Once again, I had to turn on subtitles as the music made Buck and Bucky's musings all but indecipherable mumbles. Having crews now stranded in continental Europe adds a whole new level of tension that was missing from previous episodes. Instead of merely being footage of planes flying through the sky and flak shells exploding, we now have soldiers out of their element, uncertain about who they can trust as they try to make their way back to England over land rather than by air. The contrast is stark as we now get to experience the full range of emotions as these actors are no longer covered from head to toe, in particular they are no longer required to wear their oxygen masks. I did have a little chuckle as every female member of the Belgian community was conventionally attractive. What could go wrong asking young men thousands of miles from home to follow around a slim young filly? Even the family at the beginning of the episode had a young farmer's daughter that instantly fell for one of the soldiers. I thought the emptiness of North Africa could have allowed for some greater character depth. Having nothing to do but wait for their rescue could have allowed a little downtime to get to know each other, maybe expose some personal beefs. But alas, we get one lad writing a letter to his sweetheart, and a few moments later the cavalry arrive and we are whisked immediately back to England. During this scene in North Africa, I noticed the haziness and the level of diffuse lighting made me want to rub the gunk out of my eyes. Is this a drawback of shooting in the volume? I feel like The Mandalorian had the same issue with nothing ever casting crisp shadows, particularly in scenes like this in the desert. Even in this scene, there is an approaching storm on the horizon to give the scene an almost dreamlike quality. I want to keep an eye out to check if they ever show a scene around the B-17 bombers in direct sunlight. I know, it's mainly set in England, but England does have sunny days. There also seems to be a lack of what people have described as lived-in sets. All of the cars, bikes, clothing, buildings, furniture looks too perfect. There's no rusty objects or stained walls where runoff from the gutters has allowed mosses and lichens to grow. It all looks like it was put up last week. It looks good with lots of period specific elements and general clutter, but it all looks like it was bought from a store recently. Even the milk cans have few bumps or blemishes. I did appreciate that they blacked out the headlights on the cars. Anyone else notice the underground agent who hands Quinn the piece of paper to write down his responses dropped some ash on the paper, but it was gone in the reverse angle shot? How hard would it have been to take that shot again? Come on. I know it's a nitpick, but it shows a lack of care. Am I correct to assume that the underground fellas shot Bob because he wrote the date in the incorrect format? He wrote 21st of September 1943, day, month, year, rather than September 21st 1943, or month, day, year. That took me a second watch to pick up on. Why couldn't the underground guys have explained it? This guy just won't shut up about Babyface. Lay off the Babyface, okay? I told you, I don't know nothing. So Quinn and Bailey, literally who, get transferred to some smoking hot French bird's custody. Quinn has a scarf, so the underground fella, once again, I do not know these people's names, the underground fella searches his stuff. I'm going to assume that he found a love letter in his bag because he makes reference to Louise and her family being tortured for information. So we get a name for this young girl with three minutes of screen time. Again, we know more about her than half of the flight crews. 
The interpersonal interactions are kind of wasted though, as Bucky is shown to be straining against the pressure of dangerous missions and the loss of his crewmen. Given a pass to London, he meets a mysterious blonde Polish woman who drops her panties faster than a B-17 drops bombs over Dresden. Ironically, we now know more about this mystery woman than we know about any one single member of the Air Corps. We know she fled Poland when the Germans invaded. She was married to a pilot who went away to fight and she has not heard from since. He may still be alive or dead in a potato field. She has since adopted a somewhat nihilistic outlook in response to the massive upheaval in her life. She enjoys random encounters with men but sees no point in continuing relationships as they will just be torn apart by the ongoing conflict. And I guess pilots must have been the vegetarians of the 1940s. God damn, the bedroom scenes of this act are so dingy. I really need to get an OLED TV as I notice this more often. It's almost impossible to make out anything in the room if there's even a skerrick of light in your home theatre room. I never knew women of this time period were so easy. I assumed they would all be good Christian girls, saving themselves for marriage, especially prior to the invention of the pill. But I guess women just go gaga over a man in uniform. But hey, you gotta live your life at some point. The scene with the mechanic fixing the magneto on the plane's engine as it was taxiing was a little ridiculous. I don't know, I guess I never really had any doubt he was going to fix it in time and what was the risk? They just don't fly in the mission if he fails? I did have a giggle at how the guys who picked him up in the jeep didn't even get their hair ruffled when the plane launched for takeoff directly above them. The train scene gets the blood pumping as poor old Quinn cracks under the pressure of seeing the German guards at the train station. Not helped by Bailey bringing up poor old babyface again, Quinn makes a break for freedom and is luckily held up by a second attractive female underground agent. Lucky. And the amount of brazen English speaking is doing my head in. Surely someone would report them. Thankfully, Bailey is there to remind Quinn that he'll knock him out if he does anything like that again. It's what Babyface would have wanted. The planes from the raid on Bremen return, and they're down eight planes. Oh no, Buck and Crosby are down. So now we're basically down to Bucky as the only guy I know, and even him I don't give two hoots about. Thankfully, we basically got what we really needed from these bombing missions. The takeoff and the aftermath. Rather than 20 minutes of practically static CGI plane models, with the occasional fighter zipping by. Much more efficient. Although it's ironic that the one time we don't go on a mission, two of the main characters don't return. Me thinks they're still alive, just in captivity as POWs. I didn't get to know the new guys well enough at the start of this episode, so when Helen said hi to the crew member, I just thought it was Nash, her sweetheart. But apparently he didn't make it back either. This episode falls into the same formula as the last one introducing a new character, Nash, seemingly out of nowhere, giving them a love interest, a reason to smile, then almost instantly erasing them from the show when they don't return from their mission. If you notice this show has introduced a new character and seemingly focused on them for no reason, you know they're as good as dead. Helen gets given the bad news. <laughs> Looks like you won't be needed for the rest of the season. We just got introduced to the coffee and donut girls, now you're obsolete. Cranker made it though. I didn't know he was played by the great Andy Dick. They're talking about Buck being shot down and wondering who is going to tell Egan. Probably the biggest reveal of the entire series. Who has enough of a relationship with Bucky to let him know that his best mate Buck is now lost, presumed dead? The list is endless. It could be anyone. I pity them for having such a burden. Oh wait, no, it's Red. A guy we've seen in two scenes who tells him the news after he reads a newspaper and calls the base. Never mind. They have a good code system too. No one would ever be able to crack the code of sports ball talk. Who played well today, coach? Put me in, coach. I want to be the pitcher. It's just so obtuse, like a mystery wrapped in an enigma. This episode is a bit better than the last. Like I mentioned earlier, I'd say it's worthy of a 7 out of 10. We got some level of character development, although some characters are still very shallow. A lot of people just seem to want the pew pew and the big kaboom. But I'm looking for the reason to care about what happens to these guys beyond, well, the allies are the good guys. I have to admit, I'm still surprised with the lack of diversity in this show. It must be ineligible to win any awards with a predominantly white male cast. They did have the one guy Tommy with Down Syndrome and the little kid with the artificial hand. So they're trying, I guess. I have seen in the titles that there are some black pilots at some point. I wonder if they'll be realistically depicted or if everyone will embrace them as part of the crew immediately. This was during the era of segregation after all. I have heard stories of black guys in World War II who were shot in the streets by MPs for trying to pick up white women. So the US was a hotbed of racism at this point. 
I'm also surprised that women have taken a bit of a back seat. Usually shows these days would have had one of the crew be a woman in disguise. I'm not complaining, it's what I would expect from the period, but lately these production companies haven't been able to resist. It's very refreshing. I am happy with the lowered amount of plane time in this episode. Previous episodes have spent half the runtime in the planes, where you can't identify anyone other than the few guys that the show has allowed you to build any kind of voice recognition. People interacting allows the viewer to develop feelings towards these pilots, which in turn adds meaning when one of them is shot down. Babyface was never given much of an introduction, so while the scene of him pleading to be freed from his ball turret was very emotional, the aftermath was not so much. You're more a third party watching someone else's grief. And when you don't know them very well either, it's hard to really empathise. I'm enjoying the plotline of the downed pilots behind enemy lines. Though again, we don't know these guys very well, so the stakes are lowered. I'd like to stick with them a lot more and truly get to know them, and get a closer examination of the experiences of a pilot working with the underground. It could be fascinating as long as it isn't just glossed over like it has been. These guys have been down for over a month, but you would imagine it's been two or three days. I'm interested to see what the next episode will bring with Buck and Crosby's potential capture as POWs. I hope we get to see maybe five minutes of their flight and then see them negotiate their capture and transition to the POW system. It will be a waste if they just use their absence as motivation for Bucky to get back into bombing more cities. The cinematography needs work as many scenes are either so diffuse that they look blurry or so dark I can barely see what's happening. I don't know if this is an artifact of using the volume or just a design choice, but I don't remember having as many issues with Band of Brothers and the Pacific and they had many night scenes. This episode has made me hopeful that the series can still be turned around. A little more face time with the crew to heighten the connection we have with these guys would go a long way to making the remaining battles more meaningful and not just a case of more meat for the grinder. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie. Thanks for your time and have a good one.